and welcome back. I'm Sean, and I'm here with Jeremy. This is episode uh, 16 of State of the Meta. Sweet 16. Yep, sweet 16. You still wouldn't have been kissed. That's okay. But we're also joined this week Not by a special guest, um, Jared Brehow. JB, how you going, bud? Good. How are you? Reasonably hobbing, done any modelling? Um, um, I've done a lot of thinking about modelling. Have you? Yeah. Um, and that's as far as it's gone. Hmm. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's a good step one. Yeah, it's a planning, good step one. Planning's always a Plan good step the work. One. But that's as far as I get. There's no actual work being done. But um, no, as we know, we're all in a bit of a lull at the moment with 8th edition. Like, I feel like any sort of invested in, like, you know, effort into modelling is a bit sort of... I was talking about, like, modelling on, like, a calendar. Maybe on the midis calendar. Maybe they were doing a, uh, you know... Men- Menza, Menza yeah, May. Belly's out May or something. <laughs> yeah. Can't say uh, I'm mean, inclined to do any of that, 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 that sort of work. Oh, fair enough. What about yourself? Oh, I've... I no hear modeling. grinders looking for models lately. <laughs> uh, haven't heard back from them. <laughs> you got rejected from Grinder. Uh, well, hey, at least you're honest. Uh, uh, yeah, anyway, let's move along. So this week we're going to be talking a little bit about um, the upcoming Assault event. And uh, we have the TO here. Jared, you'll be TOing that event. Correct, yes. Um, we're also going to touch very briefly on a bit of community comp because you are running the community comp format uh, as well as the men's tribord format. And lastly, we're going to start talking uh, in a bit more depth about the upcoming 8th edition uh, rules that we're seeing leak through. A continuous like, stream of Yeah, this, this drip feeding of, of, uh, of mm. changes. And, um, yeah, so that looks good. Yeah, it's interesting. How's um, your, um, how's your uh, assault list going, Jeremy? Oh, it's going pretty well. Um, Jared, you know, I'm, I'm having a look. I'm looking at various things. I've got, I've got the community comp document open again. It's been a long time since I opened that bad boy. Dust the cobwebs been. off. <laughs> I've dusted the cobwebs off. Um, and I'm looking at running the Eldar list, John. I'm, I'm, you know, I... Um, I wanted to play on theme. I feel like this event, you know, it's been, obviously Jared will talk a little bit about it um, going forward, but you've done a lot of, you've been on the podcast a lot with your ads lately, Jared. We've yes. been plugging your event and it's been heralded as being a, you know, a narrative event, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm wanting to run a, um, a kind of elder, fluffy elder list that's modeled on the idea of what's happening in the narrative, which is obviously the, the Salt of the Black Library from Ahriman, and I'm going to have an Eldar Harlequin style list defending um, the Black Library. Defending, awesome. defending against the forces of evil. Yeah, so I'm thinking, you know, what would be defending the forces of evil? Something good. Something good. Like, I'm thinking you've got your Harleys, you've got Eldrad leading his, his little band of Harlequins. It's definitely maybe some a, Harlequins. Maybe some Inquisition as well, because the Black Library, maybe the Emperor kind of hears about, hears about what's happening, and they're like, okay, let's send uh, the Auto, maybe could be the uh, Auto Hereticus, says let's send a band of Inquisitors to support Eldrad. Absolutely, so man. maybe, maybe I feel, my list will be Harlequins with Inquisition. I feel like the Imperium definitely has as much reason to, to stop Araman getting Super I, Saiyan I agree, mode. so would you agree that I would get a pretty good theme score for that, Jared? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's a good question, Jared. <laughs> Um, uh, look, possibly, let me just, let me just spell possibly. this out for you, Jared, just in case you, know, you fall into that trap that some players do fall for when people try and make these like binding statements. The old verbal contracts. The old verbal contracts. Do you agree that it's a six-inch <laughs> charge, Jared? Uh, um, give you a six and a half. Uh, mm. Anyway, um, so that's my list. So that'll be my uh, effective list. Sean, what are you looking at? Um, I spoke to Jared about my list before the event, and I said, hey, hey, Jerry, like, you know, what's going on? What should I take? And, and Jared said, like, just bring your best painted stuff. Like, just bring something that's, you know, thematic and is, and is painted well and, and just have fun. And I responded to that as positively as I thought I could. And so I'm planning um, to take my models. And so I'll be running my Imperial Fists-esque Space Marines. Uh, and they'll be uh, mustered by my Inquisition and Grey Knights. You're not running Renegades? It's... I would dearly like to run Renegades, but unfortunately, in our little gaming group, everyone seems to have sold their Imperial Guard. Um, so, as much as I want to run under comp thund- thud guns, uh, probably won't pan out, unfortunately. Yeah, so Im- Imperial Armor is also open for the Correct. event. Correct. We, we know. Um, has that factored into your list uh, building at all? Jared, I'll, I'll be honest. I'll, we'll talk about it now, because um, I thought it'd be interesting when I opened the community comp document, and you said that, um, you know, it, it was, we're doing Forge World. It's, yep. all, it's all good. I thought I'd, I'd look at like what the the, the hot Forge World um, armies are in in you know just the general meta. Sure. And probably the current top tier Forge World um, reliant list, like the the, the the most heavily utilizes Forge World in the top meta um, would be. There's a couple, right? You've got like things like I'll give some honorable mentions. You've got like the um, Yavara spam that a lot of Tower yep. players, um, Aron Nicholson had a lot of success last season using lots of Yavara. 
Then you've got uh, Eldar Corsairs. Corsairs. A yep. lot of people are running Eldar Corsairs. You've got Simon Gojkovic came down to Men's Masquerade with Corsairs list. But the most prominent um, ITC kind of, not ITC, but like competitive <clears throat> um, list using Forge World are Renegades. Yes. Um, the Siege of Rax book, which is a pr- relatively recent publication, I think 2015 publication, and it is very good. Mm-hmm. And I decided to go into the community comp document and no, no, like this is legit. You can make a, almost an ITC um, Renegades list, like the, or not necessarily a list that, that won LVO, but a very strong Renegades list for about five, six credits. Wow. Okay. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so, good. yeah, good time to bust out your Imperial Guard if they're getting dusty. Um, I mean, it's really interesting. You can say it's like battle damage. Like yeah, that's why they're right? renegades. Yeah, they're exactly. All, yeah, they're... Yeah. Um, I did reach out to the community comp team before I sort of approved Forge World going through and, and asked them whether or not they were they were happy and they were comfortable with the costings and they felt that, you know, they were, they were watertight and they definitely said... <laughs> they, they definitely said that they felt comfortable, so I, I put my trust in them. Um... It'll be interesting. I don't, I don't know like what I'm going to see. Trust in Games Workshop in regards to Eighth Edition. Oh, look! I, let's not sling any. Let's not sling any. <laughs> um, any uh, you know sludge around. But the uh, the point is, I think it's hard. It's hard because some lists, you know, they're kind of they're in, they're, they're in the meta and they or they're out of the meta and they pop into the meta um, in a different format. And we're talking about like the ITC meta. And if you're a community comp player or a community comp um, you know comper, unless you're heavily involved in a different metagame that yeah. you're probably not aware of what's going on with the, you know, the renegades and all that. Um, and like, for example, Ordnance Tyrant, right? Yeah. You know, that, that, powerful, very that's, powerful. I don't think that's credited. That's unless that whole book is not comped. One option is that it's just not a legitimate book to use, but that seems weird because it's one of the most, it's like, it's been around for two years. Like it would be comped, but the Ordnance Tyrant rule is, is no credits. There's, there's no crediting for that. And that's lets you shoot into combat. Like that is a, one of the most powerful um, command benefits and in the whole game. And it can make your artillery objectives. Yeah, it makes your thud guns obsec. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's quite a powerful build and we've definitely seen it a lot in ITC. Um, I don't know exactly how it stacks up in community comp. I guess the, the system that is in place to prevent people just grabbing models off various friends' shelves and, and putting them on is... You know, the, the paint and the presentation yes. score is, is quite heavy. Um, so, I mean, if somebody has a really nice, immaculately painted Renegades army and they want to come and fuck face, um, <laughs> then that's definitely on the table. This is definitely on the table. But um, it, it's, not, it's not the vision I had for the event, and I think a lot of the players that are playing are, are not looking at that. Maybe uh, you dirtbags are, but I nah, think, nah, I'll be <laughs> I running think in my, general... I'll be running my fluff, fluff for Quins. Um, what about you, Sean? So you're, you're running fists, Imperial fists. Yeah, I'll be using the fists off my shelf um, along with my Grey Knights and I'm just trying to work out the best computations. And like, as we said before, this event is running Community Comp and the Mensa Tribord document. So it can make things a little bit more complicated than writing your average list. Like, you can't just oh, sort definitely. of sit in front of a notepad. So I've spent a lot of time. Like, I think this is the most amount of time I've spent writing a list uh, in some time. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's been difficult, but there are challenges, but the rewards are actually also very rewarding. I find it a very rewarding process when I go through and I find little holes here and there and I, I plug them a little bit with, like, a digit or five. Um, you know, it feels good. I'm like, yeah, this is a good play. It's like an Easter egg hunt when, you're, um, <laughs> when you're a little kid. Like, when we had Easter egg recently and I was at the family lunch for Easter and the, all the little cousins, like, all the little, my cousin's kids were all there and there's, like, a whole group of them. And my sister uh, had set up an Easter egg hunt. Do they bully you? No, nah, no, they don't. Okay. Nah. So there was an Easter egg hunt, and um, all the little kids just run off, and they were, I've never seen so much excitement. And that's unless, how you feel. Unless you I'm writing a community comp. That's how you feel, feel looking <laughs> at the community much. comp. Except you're system. not looking for eggs, you're looking for holes. It's like, and that's, it's the same kind of thing. Yeah. Look, it's, it's not perfect. We all know that, I mean, no system really at the moment is, is perfect, um, but it's something that putting it in place helps guide people. You know, it helps guide people to understanding what the event wants to see. Um, it's always a player's choice to, to run what they want and circumvent that in any way possible, and I don't see a problem with that. As long as, you know, you come to the event, you enjoy the event, play what you enjoy, and, um, yeah, it's, it's going to be all good. Yeah. Yeah, like, that is that is very true, right? And um, it's there is that, that side, that aspect of things, and that's very true. I, I 
had like a, a an emotional roller coaster as I was writing my list because it was interesting interesting to see that whilst there are the odd you know Easter egg here and there throughout the the journey, um, a lot of my attempts to you know do certain things were stopped were inhibited along the way by both community comp and also the men's tribal format and I think that like holistically they've actually held up very well. Don't get me wrong, I tried to plug a lot of holes like a lot of holes, but. Very often I found that there was actually accurate costings along the way, and, and, and as I said, what I was trying to do was actually restricted. So it was an emotional journey. Um, I did experience moments of frustration and elation, but um, I've arrived at somewhere where I think that you know it's going to be a reasonably competent list. I think I'm running uh, sub-10 credits, so I think I'm about the uh, 6 to 8 mark. Okay. Um, so I'm hoping that's going to sort of fit well within the, the, the power level of the meta that we see on the weekend. Um, it was also interesting to note that, like, when you add, because of the way the community comp costings work with the Mentor Tribord format, if your sideboard A, for example, has five credits, yes. and your sideboard B and C might have one or two credits, and your main board, uh, your main list has five credits as well, that's actually a ten credit you list. You pay the ten. Yeah, regardless of which tribord you yeah. take, like which sideboard, doesn't matter, yeah. you, you're going to pay that ten credit comp score. So... Yeah. It was interesting because as soon as you like make this decision, I'm like, okay, like you might make two sideboards and you might make them like one credit each, and then you might make your third sideboard and go, oh, I really want to squeeze this, so you you make you like you um you make a concession, you go, okay, well, I'll pay two credits if I have to, yeah, I'll yeah. pay two, but then you can go back to your you know your first two sideboards, and go, okay, well, I can actually now add an additional credit to each of these, so it has been a pretty enjoyable process. Yeah. My logic for the for the sideboards based on that was to try to keep them as low credits as possible. Mm. Um, but having said that, it also makes sense to do the, the reverse, which would be to have a, a main board with a low credit platform, mm. um, say three or four credits, and then have each of your sideboards specking in a certain way, specializing in a certain, um, like, uh, what would you call it? Like a road fork. Yep. And have a high credit sideboard. So you could have three credit main So list. make your tech choices yeah. heavily credited. And Correct. That, that would allow for more um, powerful, polarization in your... Yeah, and your, more powerful tech yeah. choices. I completely agree with that logic. That's very good logic. Um, I didn't. I didn't feel that I had the capacity to do that as I was writing my list. So I ended up dumping all my credits in my main board, knowing that didn't matter which sideboard I was going to take. The majority of my power level was mm. in that main board. Mm. Well, because but you are right. I do agree with what you're saying about te- you know make, it allows your branch and your well, force to be very strong. One of the things is for for a sideboard. I think it's it, it's very pertinent to have a Kalexis on a sideboard, even in a format of community comp where Death Stars are less prevalent than they would be in uncomped. Or mm-hmm. you know, yeah. um, it's still nice to have a Kalexis, but a Kalexis is actually uncomped. Yeah. So if you have a Cyber with a Kalexis, you can have one. Exactly. But what you could do, and what a way if you if if you're running a Kalexis and you want to put it in a higher sideboard, um, higher comp sideboard, is you can then deliver the Kalexis more um, efficiently. Yes. So you can then put it in a bunker with an escape hatch, which is in the, uh, a further two credits, I believe. Yep. Um, so then your you know now your Kalexis in a bunker is two credits. And you're starting to work towards a higher credit sideboard. So it would be possible to have a like sideboard with four or five credit sideboards with your anti psycho sideboard involving something like, um, from let's say an Eldar perspective, yep. a Kalexis in a, in a bunker with um, maybe like uh, some, some barrage, like, a, you know, like yeah. some sort of high um, quality barrage. And what, to, would, what would you recommend, Jeremy, for high quality barrage from Elder? Oh, maybe. Well, we're playing Forge Bell, so maybe a War Punter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would that'll do it. Yeah, what are they comped at? I can I can I, vouch they're good. I don't think they're that. Um, oh, they're probably about four credits. I don't know. Um, I actually don't know. Uh, they are four four C one. Okay, so it makes sense. Yeah, they are, they are pretty hefty. But you could do like uh, you know, as I said, if you do a, a, a Kalexis in a bunker with a War Punter on a sideboard, that's a six credit sideboard. Um, if you have your main list only at two credits, say that you could. Have all your sideboards pushing the like you know, another great example would be you put a wraith knight on a sideboard, that's a, a six credit. So that's already yeah. synchronizing your war punter sideboard with your wraith knight sideboard. Yeah, and then your next sideboard could be a bunch of ICs, like because if you put lots of ICs in your sideboard, they would trigger the IC tax. So you could then have a yeah. five to six credit IC sideboard. So that's already sounding good. Yeah, that's very true. I was thinking if you wanted to play more conservatively, perhaps you go with like a monofilament battery because they're also. Uh, very low on There's the credits. zero credits, yeah. There's zero. So there you go. If you wanted to go the other way and you wanted to have all your characters in your main board, you could then go with your Kalexis in a bunker for just two credits. I had a unit of those on my main board already um, because they're so... And we're talking about the um, 
the Shadow Weavers batteries called okay, yep. um, Eldar, and they are just a very versatile unit. I mean, this, these are the same kind of decisions you were making for Men's Open last year with sideboards. Correct, but that was, a, that was an uncomped event, so it was a lot easier to just take optimal sideboards with with, zero, with no consideration for, yeah, of course. for credit. However, um, one of my sideboards for Men's Open was just a Kalexis in a bunker. Yep. Um, with a with a unit of shadow weavers, believe it or not, because still good <laughs> because they were what I could only fit in with points, and, and that was a that was a lower point sideboard for that event. Correct. Uh, they're only, so uh, now you have five hundred three fifty. That's right. Yeah, and it's interesting because the five hundred point sideboard. Uh, what what I realized very quickly was as soon as you open up that five hundred points, you can actually fit a whole another detachment in there. Like you can actually like afford to take up a HQ, two troops, and then like three heavies. Yeah, actually fits yeah. in five hundred points. So. You could find a lot of like very very diverse, very like really um, you know well crafted tribord lists at this event. I agree, um, and I just wanted to since you're obviously here, Jad, and we've kind of like um, we've we've gone into jumped into the discussion of the assault, but we've started with like inside out in a way. We've started with like that <laughs> high level yes. analysis, but let's take a step back. Um, you know, Sean and I've introduced kind of what we were talking about, what we're thinking about playing. But what? How would you um, kind of? Um, t- you know, tell us about the event. What? How did you conceive it? Like, how did it all kind of come to you? Obviously, to obviously run this narrative event, yep. but also utilize the men's tribal format and community comp in this nice little mix. Yeah, good question. So, there's a couple, a couple of small questions within that. Um, to start off with, the narrative event was something that um, I had a little bit of experience with running last year. Uh, we ran the hunt myself and, and Matt Antonello, and that was a sort of narrative themed type event. Um, I got a lot of really good positive feedback from that. A few players asking me if I was going to run something similar the following year. I, um, I'll just not to interject. Like that was an amazing event. I really enjoyed the hunt, and that was a, uh, a standout narrative event. There was a projector set up with good cutscenes, storyline. It was incredibly immersive. I had a lot of a lot of fun. It was with a that good event. event. It was yeah. very good. It was, was a great, great start event. to the year for last year. Yeah. It was about April last year, right? Uh, April, I believe. Yeah. yeah, it was a good start to the year. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and and that kind of stuff was was something I was hearing quite a lot about, and uh, people wanted me to run it again, so I thought I would do it. But um, it seems it's always seemed kind of interesting to me that we have, you know, a multitude of different type of events focusing on different things. We have our very hobby centric events. Uh, you got your, your arc things like preferred enemy and, and Norris and things. You've got your very competitive events like your Mensa Opens, your Can Cons, your um. You know various other other uh, events, um, which covers you know the main things that we look at with the hobby, but the the narrative and the storylines are a fairly large side to it as well. Um, you know the the Black Library book series and, and all those kinds of things sell incredibly well, and generally a lot of people get into the hobby at the start because they're intrigued by this storyline and, and this narrative. So it's something that gets left behind a lot for events. Oh uh, yeah, it's an incredibly immersive narrative. I really agree with that. Um, I've you know, an avid reader. I've read a lot of the books, and the storyline and the and the universe of Forty K is incredibly, um, you know, engaging. Mm. And I really enjoy that aspect of people it. People take it for granted. I they think. definitely do. Yeah, people kind of just they get lost in their their own little hop, their own little projects, and say, "Oh, you know, I'm building this story. I'm building this is the story of my army." But they forget that there's hundreds of books and hundreds of tomes of of, of what, like even some of the older books. And I know a lot of it's been retconned. Yeah, but there's a lot of old books, whether it's from second edition or even the Rogue Trader days, that are just tomes of knowledge, like the old Realm of Chaos books and, oh, and all absolutely. these insanely absolutely. amazing, almost collector's editions these days. And yeah, I applaud you for going back to the narrative, but how are you intertwining it into this tournament? So the idea um, is that there will be an overarching series of events and each one will focus on a different facet of the story or a different storyline element. But the idea is to put the player in the part of doing it. So you actually immerse yourself in the storyline. You and your army are there to achieve a particular goal. Um, and and that, that's the concept. So the missions themselves will tie into the theme. And there's going to be some, um, I guess, custom missions. You know, not, not straight out of the rule book. And each of those will tie into a set, almost like a separate chapter of the overall story. Um, as well as that... Um, there's going to be a lot of, you know, additional things that I'm going to keep sort of under, under lock and key at the moment, um, that I'm going to try okay. and build into helping Bit of a yeah, build, build the overall sort of just, 
immersion, I guess. A bit like be. Mission 5 of the Men's Masquerade. Yeah. Yeah, well, your, your missions were actually a really good example of that kind of thing. They all had a, a you know, a, a part of a chapter and an overlying story. How did you which find, cool. the, like, obviously, um, just as a, a slight a slight digression, how did you find those missions? Uh, I enjoyed it. They were fun, yeah. So, e- each one had, not only was it a different type of mission, you know, it wasn't just a simple case of achieve X or achieve Y, but it had a, a reason how it tied all into the, the little storyline you had running, which was kind of fun. Yeah. I think I think it's good to, to get to the table and have an idea of what, you know, when, when we play, the, these miniatures are meant to represent things, and having an idea of what this game and this battle represents is, is pretty cool, mm. and it's something that a lot of events don't do. Yeah, I, I agree. Completely agree. Um, at the hunt, as I said, not to keep going back over turf we've already gone over, but that was a very immersive event, and those cutscenes, like, really, like, they set the tone for each mission. Um, in a similar way, Jeremy, to the mission pack for Menza Masquerade, where you know we read, there's a bit of storyline behind things, which was um, you know read out the, um, I guess the hunt took it to like the next level, do you know what I mean? And mm. uh, there was a lot of, as you said, cutscenes and stuff, and players got to really engage and like go on a quest. Like that event actually became like a journey, a quest for the uh, for the players to embark on and achieve this end goal. So irrespective of what, you know, the game result might have been, whether they won or lost or, you know, who slayed who, whatever, there was still this, like, this ongoing end game goal that players are trying to achieve. Oh, well, the final mission, and that was great. If, I, if I recall correctly, um, the final mission was the Relic, um, and the Relic was represented by a Cypher model. Correct. And you, yep. had, you had actually done those up. So they were, you had to capture Cypher. And you had to capture Cypher. He was the Relic. Yep. And if you captured him, if you won that game, you actually got to keep the Cypher model. Um, and, and therefore, you won yourself a custom-built JB Miniatures <laughs> Cypher. Yeah, it was something that was pretty cool to be able to do. And um, I think, again, just very, very different and unique. Um, very unique. I yeah. love the idea of putting on an event that people can walk away saying, remember that time when... Um, and the fact that you guys have displayed such, you know, oh. fond memories of, of that kind of is a testament well, you, to that. You, I'll be honest, like, I don't remember, like, playing top table at Terracon. I remember playing a lot of, like, you I know... Don't, it's because you didn't. I don't think you did. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you. I don't, I don't remember a lot of these, these, like, really big games. But I do remember, I do remember the game I played where I, I captured Cypher. I do remember that game quite clearly. I think I've told this story before, but I, I was playing in the, in the last game of the hunt. I was playing um, Adam Ray who's um, one of the Ballarat boys, and um, I was running for that event. I had Cypher in my army. Yes. Because I'm, yes. A, very, I'm a very fluffy guy. I'm a very <laughs> hobby, story-driven gamer. I think, I think, and, I think we're going to have to stop you there. Just, just, <laughs> just like this coming event, I'll be playing uh, Elder. It's good to get a fresh perspective no, on this, it's Jared. true. <laughs> then, you know, I was running Cypher, and believe it or not, in that final mission, Cypher... Captured, captured Cypher. Cypher. I do remember he that was story. On, the, the, the game ended with Cypher on Cypher. Oh, it's like Alpharius being not Alpharius. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I, I was pretty immersed. <laughs> um, let's just say that. <laughs> <laughs> That's no, what we good. aim for. <laughs> it, was, it was good. No, but it's another. It's a little challenge. Like, and the good thing about narrative events is, is kind of... Normally, you have a challenge of, you know, it might be, oh, I'm trying to um, build as strong as list as I can. Or it could yep. be, I'm trying to paint, get the big, best paint score as I can. Yep. With a narrative event, it's you're trying to do these things while also creating a, a storyline in your own army that allows you to achieve the missions in a way that you feel is progressing the narrative as well. Absolutely. And and look, accidentally, it's kind of played out that I think this is going to be a really nice farewell to 7th edition as well. That's true. It will be very close to the end of 7th. But before we move on to the upcoming leaks, I do have a couple more questions for you. Just because Absolutely. We've already started talking about the assault, so we may as well continue on that train. As you said, the narrative side of things is going to be very prominent in this event, and uh, I'm a big fan of it, and I've written a couple of stories in, in my time, and uh, I've written like legitimate eight-page stories of about my army and, and, and the triumphs that they've had to go through and the trials that they've had to overcome. So if players were to, to say, bring you a story at the event, and people are going to have a lot of fluff behind their armies, there's a lot of that part you know, weighing in on the decisions, How are you going to have time to read all these stories and... and, and critique them? Are they, how is it yes. going to play out? Yes. Short answer is yes. Yeah, short answer is yes. Um, there's actually a good 15 points of presentation towards having a storyline, not not only just a storyline for your army, but why it's relevant to the event. Why it's relevant? Why it's relevant to the event. So somebody brings an orc list and they say, you know, I've named my war boss and here's how he likes to fight and here's what's going on with his army. That's great. That'll make you some points. 
that's narrative. That's cool. Um, what I really want to look for, for for the max points in that particular criteria is the reason why this war boss is interested in helping Eldrad is X and Y, and, and here's how that's involved. So not only is it encouraged, it's it's rewarded. Yeah. That's good, because it allows you to also um, identify original material as well. So that's yep. very prudent in that sense, because you, you'll know straight away whether it's just their, you know, their story they've dug up off their PC from six, 12 months ago, whatever. Yep. Uh, this, you're looking for stories that are relevant to the Black Library. Mm. Yeah, that's good. I like it. I've done, look, I've done that in the past, and, and it's been one of... I've always kind of looked and turned to the story as a way for my, me to try to like get pain points because I'm, I wouldn't to consider... To excuse the haters list not, that you're running. Yeah, and I'm not the best. I, I, <laughs> you guys have given... You know, people have criticised me in the past for not trying hard enough, but I, I feel like I do struggle a little bit with painting. It's something that I'm, I will, you know, continue to work on. But in the past, I've looked at the rubrics of scoring for painting and there's often been like narrative, uh, supporting fluff narrative components in, yeah. in paint scores. And I've always shot for those pain points, but I've, I've never felt like I've been rewarded. Yeah. I, I've, I've written as... Similar to Sean, I've written multiple page stories. I've turned up to events with seven, eight pages of fluff and I've had paint judges just kind of ask me if I have fluff and I say, uh, you know, yeah, I do it. Yep. I've got to get out of the bag. They say, don't worry about it. I've, tick I've, the box I've, ticked, I've ticked your box. Yeah. And I kind of think to myself, well, I could have firstly just not even had anything and told you I did or I could have had a half a page and I would have got the same Root, Result. Like the t- you know, Score is the guy that photocopied one of the pages out of the codex and yeah, put it in a, I would, in a frame. I would really yeah. strongly oh, echo stuff that guy. <laughs> I would strongly echo what you've just said there, Jeremy, because I, you know, I think you're very right. There has been a number of events where I've attended where um, the judge at the time, I'm not going to name names, I'm going to no. call people out, but yeah, I had the same experience where I said, yeah, I've got fluff, and I pull out my eight page like narrative, like it's a novel, like the thing is a short story. It's yeah. like, and. I don't really hold it against the judge because, like, they've already got an incredible amount of work to do over the weekend. Do you know what I mean? To go around and, and, and assess all these armies on their, on their paint, or the merit of their paint scores. Like, that's a big job. But it just felt like perhaps those efforts weren't really appreciated. It, it, you know, I don't know. It's just, it just is a disparity. Like, it, it, and this is, once again, this is no one's fault. It just comes down to the way in which a player pack's worded. And yes. If a player pack says something like, you know, they give you the impression that a certain result, a certain amount of effort is going to achieve a certain result. If, the, if that doesn't occur, it can create sour grapes. Yeah, If you of feel like, you know, and it, it happens not just with, with this kind of thing, it happens with a multitude of things um, where people think if I put extra work into freehand, I'm going to get extra points. But if they don't see that, that the, the time they invest in freehand correlate into an increased paint score, they'll feel like, well, what was the point of spending tireless hours freehanding every model yeah. if I got one point more than I would have got if I hadn't spent those 20 hours freehanding certain models. Um, so there's there's those certain things. And that all comes down to um, my experience would just be the, the, the rubric design itself and also the, the judge's um, understanding of that rubric. Sometimes the people yeah. that write the rubric are not the people that, that are judging it. So there's a disparity between the, those particular people. Sometimes the rubric claims that it's doing something that it doesn't achieve. So there's a, a variety of things. We've had these discussions as well because absolutely, um, Jared. You know, you and I did the paint judging at Men's and Masquerade, uh-huh. and we went around pretty uh, diligently trying to give people accurate paint scores, and we scaled the scores afterwards as well, which is something yep. I kind of insisted on doing. But then we still had uh, you know multiple people who were quite disappointed with their scores, and that's just unfortunately the the way it works. Yeah. I mean, pa- paint scores and paint scoring and paint rubrics is probably a subject you could almost dedicate an entire episode to on its own. You know, there's so much of um, what goes into it and what gets rewarded. I had quite an interesting time writing the painting rubric. Um, what I wanted to do, and I guess there's a big dilemma on if somebody ticks all the boxes, uh, but maybe doesn't lack the skills or sorry, doesn't have the skills. They lack the skills that another painter has. Um, and that painter also ticks all the boxes. Should you be rewarded purely for effort, or should you also be rewarded for um, displaying a skill and, and having a better quality painted army? And, and that's not necessarily uh, a one-answer question. Um, but there's a, look, there's a lot of things that go into paint score. So what I've actually done is, I think there are a maximum of 85 points you can get from paint, but it's capped at 75. So there are multiple ways to earn full points. So that if you have done a lot of the things that are required to be done, you can earn full points, which won't affect your overall score, 
Um, but those additional 10 points that are scorable can we'll be used break. to tie breaks yeah. and best presented. That's an awesome idea. I so like that. Players, yeah, players that go to the extra effort and are also quite talented may have a better chance at best presented re- uh, uh, awards. However, a player that has gone to the effort of, of doing the things that are required can still max their points. And I yeah. think that's important to have the ability to max points through having the will to do those things, regardless of how well you execute them. Yeah, uh, that's very, uh, I agree. That's, that's a very good way of doing it. I have a couple of things that I would probably add to that discussion. The first one is, um, you know, ticking all the boxes. You use that catchphrase there, ticking all the boxes. And yeah. it's sometimes said in a very, like, negative connotation. Oh, that player just tries to tick all the boxes. But I think that, at the end of the day, it comes down to being a holistic, um, you know, holistic hobbyist slash gamer. You've got to be adequate on the tabletop. You've got to be an adequate painter. You've got to be adequate freehand, adequate shading, adequate basing, adequate narrative. Like, yeah. you need to put in effort in all these categories. And I've seen cases of players who have painted these amazing models that look outstanding, but they either don't have a display board or the basing on their models looks very lackluster. And it's like, you know what? You probably could have taken a couple hours out of this category and put them into that category for a better overall result. Do you know what I mean? Because it, it helps tie everything together and make it all look, look better, more presentable um, in it from a more holistic perspective. So I definitely understand where you're coming from, Jeremy, when you said that players sometimes invest a lot of energy in like a single criteria and they don't feel like they're rewarded enough for that. I, my counter argument there was that maybe you could have dropped a couple hours there and worked on something that maybe you're not as comfortable with to try and tick all the boxes. It should not be a negative thing, I don't think. I, like, I, I no. agree with that. Yeah, but like, I, I'm talking, yeah, obviously in my specific point, I was talking more about I, I don't feel like I um, received any differentiation in that category because it was a binary, a binary category. Yeah. But... Um, that maybe that was maybe I should have done more investigation beforehand to find out about that. Um, yeah. Asking maybe I could have asked the TO about the rubric, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to find out if it was simply a yes or no, or whether it was a scaling um, award system. So it's just look, it's complicated. But I think if people are serious about events, and yeah. there are players um, around Australia that care a lot about competitive 40k events, and not just like the ITC points, they care about walking home with the first overall prize. Sure. So they want to get those pain points, get those bonus points. And those players that really want to win, they it behooves them to message TOs, double check player packs, find you know, find out what they need to do to maximize the chance of getting points. I also, yeah, I, I think that comes down a lot to the TO as well, making sure that the player pack outlines that information in a way that is accurate to what's done on the day. Yeah. Um it's hard to do. It's a it's it an easy goal, easy to say, but it's a lot harder to actually achieve that um, when someone says anything. Like, when anyone says anything, it can always be interpreted in different ways by different people, and their experiences will obviously adapt that interpretation differently. So, yeah, you're right, though. It is about trying to be as clear and as succinct as you possibly can be when you're writing up your player pack. I do agree with that. All right, just before we um, change topic, I just thought I'd, one last question that I wanted to ask you, Jared, about the assault was... Um, why did you choose to, you know, and I, we touched on this earlier, but why did you choose to go with men's a tri-boy format? Mm-hmm. And why did you choose to go with community comp? And I know they're two very long-winded questions, but we can yep. try to touch on each of them. Okay, so regarding the tri-board format, um, now the tri-board format, interestingly, is something that you guys, Sean and Jeremy, you, you pretty much developed, um, you know, taking taking sort of cues from other games. Uh, and that was rolled out last year at Menza Open. Correct, yeah. I enjoyed that facet. I think at that particular event, I wasn't in a position to take multiple tri boards, uh, so I, I didn't partake in it as such. But I really liked the idea and the concept, and you guys have talked about it on the podcast before, you know, the pros and cons and, and what you feel it does for the game, adding another level of, of diversity and flexibility. And I feel like the one run that it was given wasn't enough for players to really get a sense of how it worked. And to get enough feedback to see whether or not, you know, it, it did work. So I wanted to play with that and, and run with that again. Um, and I, I think even though it is a competitive element, okay, it, it's to, a lot to do with gameplay and, and sort of recognising that competitiveness, it kind of fits the narrative as well. I imagine that a lot of these battles are representations of a force that is led by a commander. And when a commander goes against an enemy, they don't just take the guys that are in the back, they adapt to what they yeah. expect the enemy to have. So I, I think that fits a narrative in a way as well. 
Um, but yeah, I definitely just wanted to get more traction behind the idea because I, I personally love the idea of, of the sideboard. Um, and, and another thing is I, I did vary it slightly in that I removed the bonus for not taking a sideboard, mm. um, which I know a, a couple of players have been a little bit unsure about, but I didn't want to incentivize the option to not take one. I understand if players don't have the ability to take one, or they, they don't want to take one, but I didn't want to give them a reward for not engaging in a system that I wanted to be part of the event. Oh, look, that's, um, that's very insightful, I think. Uh, you know, the three of us, collectively, we've all had a, a, mo- a number of really long-winded discussions about the pros and cons of, you know, doing what, 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 what's being done, etc., etc., and I think you've arrived at a very healthy conclusion uh, based on a lot of those discussions, um, you know, not to take away from your own thoughts, I think that what you're doing is is a is a really great idea. Just touching on the sideboard element, I do agree. Like there is a reason to say, you know, let's not incentivize people for not engaging. And you're you're saying people you need to engage in this system. And I also agree with the perspective of the narrative. I know that there is no way in hell that you know a, a couple of grey knights with Drago would be the whole force that might be defending a planet from a demonic incursion. There would be, like, a number of reserve elements, and, like, anyone who's read any piece of narrative anywhere at any time would know that there is a number of elements that are coming into the play. There's always an overarching, more, like, uh, you know, wider scale of things. So, saying, yeah, like, you know, Gilliman over here is just woken up, and he's going to, like, you know, bring all these armies... He's grabbed 40 of his marine mates. He's grabbed 40 marines, and that's it. And that's it. That's ridiculous. He didn't bring the hunters and stalkers. (laughs) He didn't bring the land raiders. Exactly. He'd have all those in reserves. Oh, hang on. We've got a big demonic incursion over here. Let's roll up the land raiders. We'll crush them. You know what I mean? Like It looks like there's a lot of shit in the sky. Exactly. We've got whirlwinds. What are we doing? (laughs) Game over. Exactly right. (laughs) So I do agree. I think you've arrived at a very healthy conclusion from all of that. Um, Regarding tribord format... Uh, it, it's an odd choice. As you said, it's only been run once in, at an event prior to this, and it's a very small sample size. I mean, immediately there was eight games, there was eight rounds for that yep. event, but it's still a very small sample size when you look at other formats like ITC, Community Comp, uh, you know, whatever it is. They've run thousands of, 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 of rounds, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Events across the world. And so you're right. Um, there is a lot of merit to giving something a, another chance to sort of, you know, come into play and, and uh, impact on things. So, uh, just sorry, not to um, cut you off there, Sean, but I remember when we were preparing the Men's Are Open, um, the whole event, and I, was, I, I played in that event. Um, Sean was tearing that one, and I had an amazing time not only, can, you know, helping to prepare the format and all that, but actually playing the event. And some of my best games, and in fact, not even some, my best game was probably, I played two games at that event against Dean Sinbeck. Um, I played him once within the original five-game um, tournament, um, and then I played him once in the in the finals as well, that we played yeah. at PAX. And Dean was one of the few other players that I played that actually had a sideboard. Most of the players that I um, versed were running mono lists with their, either their... Um, I believe additional it was Warlord trade. Additional Warlord stuff. trade, or was it... Uh, re-roll reserves. Re-roll uh, C's. Plus C's. Plus C's, was it? Is that the plus C's or re-roll C's? I think it was a re-roll check. C's from, from memory. That sounds about right. Okay, and, and um, most people just kind of min-maxed to, to get the benefit from the extra wall or trade. People that were taking Codiers, so yeah. they had a five-up re-rollable C's, or they were taking Azrael, who already gets two, so they get a third. Yeah, there was a lot of... Exactly. There was a lot of running a, a mono list with the attempt of using that as a strategy. Yeah, even like uh, I know Kane. Kane took plus one. I believe he took the um, plus one C's, the the um, re-roll mirror C's. codex, and no, he, took, yeah, he took the mirror codex in his list, and then he had the reroll C's. Things yeah. like yeah. Like just things like that. Yeah, and I, you know, was playing a lot of players, and they would give me their list, and then I kind of had a, a, a sideboard, and they didn't even have a sideboard. Yeah. So normally, it's this it's this secretive process of of you secretly pick your sideboard. Well, it's an additional gameplay element, and the thing is, somebody else not having it not only means they're not engaging, it kind of robs you of that engagement. Well, and it, it also gives the player with a sideboard an incredible advantage, because you, they don't even have a bluff that they can play on you. They just give you a list. You yeah, just you, you know it. what it is. And I, I found outlet. that really, um, you know, I, I, it was very easy for me to just pick the optimal sideboard with no, no like, interplay. But then when I did play Dean, and Dean had spent a lot of time in... Um, we, you know, we speak about Dean a lot, um, you know, in our podcasts, but with that particular event, he did a lot of um, Facebook Live videos and stuff leading up to Men's Are Open, where uh-huh. he spent, like, 
minutes and ten minute like videos at one at a time over the course oh, he, of he spent hours like, hours and hours overall writing his sideboards, discussing them, strategizing about them, getting feedback from all his followers on, on Facebook. And then he actually resubmitted his list before the deadline. He decided to change one of his sideboards. And so Dean was super in tune with what was going on. He was playtesting his list. So when I played Dean, the first game I played against him, I chose my collect And just for, to give a little bit of context to this story, I was playing an Eldar, kind of just MSU Eldar uncomp style list with Wraith Knight, Warp Spiders, and, and Scat Bikes. Yep. And um, Dean had his um, Cabal Star, and he had an Imperial Knight as one of his sideboards, yep. I believe. And and one, another one of his sideboards he took, he had Obliterators. Yeah, um, yeah. And it, which is that the... Cult um, of Destruction Exactly, or the, right? the formation that allows them to shoot twice with the yep. um, Warp Smith. Anyway, so Dean, for his, our first game, cho- chose the... Um, he, his strategy was to choose yeah. the... Um, what do they call obliterators in order to try to pop my bunker with my Klexus. Okay. And he didn't have any success with that. So we had this like big discussion about it after the game and we kind of said, you know, oh, maybe you could have done this, maybe you could have done that. And he went home, thought about it. And in the week break between the next game, because he knew, I think he knew he was going to play me the next game, he had totally revamped his strategy and chose a different cyborg. He chose yeah. his Imperial Knight cyborg. And the game played out very differently. Um, and I find that fascinating because I had to choose... I had to then kind of second-guess myself and go into my head about what my cyber was. Mm. Fortunately for me, or whatever, however you want to spin it, the Kalexis was the optimal choice regardless. But it was just such an interesting experience to have with him. And I thought it was awesome. So I, I think, yeah, you're right. Like, giving it another run, and maybe to give you the other opinion from what Sean said, maybe disincentivizing that mono list will push people towards actually taking part in the experience. I'm, I'm really keen to see what kind of list people submit and what they do. Um, yeah, I'm excited to see what happens. Yeah, me too. I, I think it's going to be great. And I think that a lot of the um, a lot of the actual data that we draw from this, because we'll cover this extensively post-event, the post event, and we'll be analyzing things quite in depth um, in, in, you know, in, uh, in following podcast episodes. But I do agree with what you're saying. Uh, you know, I completely agree. Having that that interplay between players and the lists and the sideboards they choose to take to fill gaps in their army to make different plays and, and try and counter metas and, and whatnot, I think it's going to be very, very interesting. And I wonder if, you know, perhaps... I, I know that Age of Sigma, not to segue too much, but Age of Sigma does run sideboards, mm-hmm. right, uh, in their competitive events in other places in the world. And I think that perhaps as 8th edition rolls out, maybe that will be a, a really right sort of, you know, arena in in which we sort of expand on this format and we continue to pursue this format and perhaps with a little bit more experience, players will actually engage with it more and appreciate it Well, it, it makes more. sense. Exactly right. It makes, like, just, like, coming from some, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, my position of not really being familiar with Age of Sigma um, that, that much, it does, one of the biggest criticisms we've had with the Men's Tribord format is the difficulty in writing a list that has, like, you know, as you know, Jared and Sean, yeah. um, and people that are listening, feel free to check out the format on the website the Menza website, um, you have to make it so that you have your core detachment, your primary detachment has to be in your in your, in your main board, yep. and then you have to have a maximum, you can only have a maximum of a single detachment on your sideboard. And the reason we did this is just because the current 40k list building, um, what would you, faculties or whatever you want to call them, infrastructure, is very complex. Yes. People struggle to write a normal list of Warhammer, let alone a, a, a sideboarded list. Yeah. But... If you look at AOS, AOS is a lot more free. It's a lot more just like take whatever you want. Yep. So maybe that format of just take your tactical squad, take your Eldar Striking Scorpions, put them in a list if you want. Maybe that just flexibility makes sideboards a lot easier to implement. Do you know what I mean? Because you just oh. say put whatever you want on your sideboard as long as your whole list is legal, whatever. Done. I completely agree. It also gives players more of a chance to experience their models off the bat. Um, you know, when we, when, as we move into 8th edition... People are going to be running their, their, their list, right? And they're going to be wanting to experience new units because everything's going to change, right? They're going to want to experience all these different things. If you have sideboards, you can actually take, um, you know, a, a far greater diversity of models and get experience with them and get to play test them at events, you know, a, a, to give you more feedback on what's good and what's not good. I think it's a great format for it. Mm. Unfortunately, Absolutely. it looks like, um, it does look like Age of Sigmar is going to be simplifying things to a very large degree. And who knows? Perhaps, like, perhaps I don't know. I'm not a prophet. I'm not a prophet, but perhaps you heard it here first. Perhaps, maybe, (laughs) 
triboards will add a layer of complexity that players will engage with once the game itself is simplified. Who knows? Yeah, that's that's fair. Um, okay, last element to the question, Joe, just before we, we end it. What, what about community comps? So you've already gone with cyborgs. Yep. You're adding in another another um, element of, of uh, what would you call it, restriction or, or, yep. or comping. Yep. What's the deal? So partly it is a follow-on from last year. Last year's event used community comp, so it's kind of easy to continue that. I also feel that given the concept behind the event being a narrative, fun, engaging event, I know that a lot of players, unfortunately, disengaged immediately by no comp. And especially a lot of those players that are really invested in the hobby side of things uh, are a lot more comfortable with comp. So it was a bit of a a twofold reason there. Um, I also think that Last time sideboards were run, it was in a no-comp environment, and I wanted to give the players that might not have attended that event some exposure to the sideboard. So those two things actually kind of led into into another in that they, they support more people getting their hands on that tri-board format. Fair enough. Yeah, well, as we know, uh, Victoria has been, over the last 24 months, predominantly community comp. That's yep. been the, the mainstream format. It has been shaken up a little bit more recently with ITC becoming more prevalent. But historically, histor- uh, Victoria has run almost only community comp events. Within yes, 7th edition, yeah. Within 7th edition, correct. So over the last 18 months, we've probably seen players who have constructed armies and, and you know, gone out, assembled, built armies and, and, and made all these big projects and stuff that purely have community comp in mind. Yes. And they might have been, as you said... Uh, very astutely, you said that maybe they've been discouraged by the fact that it's no comp. So you're right. This does give the Victorians, uh, diehard community comp fans, a, a good opportunity to engage in, in this other element, being triboards, while staying on familiar turf, yep. which is community comp. And we, and they're, they're certainly compatible systems. When we designed the triboard format, it was designed to be fully compatible with any um, exterior comp system because it, it doesn't interact with... Um, it doesn't interact with the tertiary compings of, of, of like attaching points to certain units or limiting certain units. All it does is just create a, a, a way in which to facilitate sideboards. Um, so yeah. it's fully compatible with community comp or with any other comp um, system. So when we wrote it from off the bat, we fully expected um, there to be community comp events with it. And we're glad, it's really good that you're running it to at least give it a, a go before um, we have the, the end of seven. Because once, as you, as you said, once eight hits, it could be a very different. Everything could change. Like who knows what's going to happen with community comp? Who knows what's going to happen with comp ITC, in general? Yeah, yeah. whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, spot on. All right, guys. Well, let's um let's cut it there, and we'll take an ad break. We'll throw it to Dwayne, and then we'll come back, and we're all going to discuss the most recent leaks for uh, eighth edition forty k. What do all great war games have in common? They're played on a great table. Dwayne here from District Terror Men's Gaming, and we can design the board of your dreams. Whether it's Age of Sigma, 40k, Infinity, or any range of table warfare, we have it covered. With options to suit any budget, we can create a multitude of worlds for your battles. So get in touch via our Facebook page, and we can get started making your terrain dreams a reality. Thank you for that, Dwayne. Uh, Dwayne from District Terror there. Uh, working away pretty hard, I believe, on a couple of display boards upcoming for Terracon, so that, that'll be good to see. Oh, really? Yeah. You've got a lot of projects on the go there, kid. Man, there's a lot going on on that page, so definitely check him out on Facebook, guys. All right, so we, we turn our attention once again. Uh, I mean, last edition of the fifth, uh, 15th podcast, we touched on the initial leaks, um, and that was only a week ago. We recorded that one week from, from today, and... Um, it's been a lot has come out. So th- those original leaks were just that idea they were talking about. Um, we, we knew there were going to be stat changes. Yeah. Um, the Games Workshop community guys did a big, uh, I think it was a Facebook Live video. I think they may have done it on Twitch as well. It was a, about an hour-long video. Yep. They, they answered questions, but since then, they've been doing almost daily releases discussing various things, various elements of the game. Literally that are every day. And it's looking like, initially, we kind of said, oh, it looks like they're AOSing it. But every release, we're seeing a, 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 almost a, you know, a, nails are being <laughs> are being hammered <laughs> have in, into the coffin, hammered into the coffin of the 40k that we've come to know and love over the last few editions. Um, 
But it's not all negative because I, there's a lot of excitement. And to be honest with you, I'm not feeling negative about it. I think people have... Um, there's been this assumption that the competitive gamers are going to hate the fact that uh, things are changing. But I feel that it's fresh. It feels good that maybe... Maybe I'll be able to get used to those heavy bolter guys I bought from a second-hand lot. Maybe I'll be able to use missile launchers. Um, so let's let's have a chat. Uh, what do you- I'll admit to some trepidation. I'm a little bit trepidatious about things. Um, I think it could go either way. Like, making sweeping changes is fine. Like, the concept of changing things dramatically is 100% okay, and I actually encourage it. But the more you change things, it, it gives you more opportunities to get things wrong. That's true. So... As I said in the last podcast, uh, you know, last week, um, I'll reserve judgment until it actually drops on the shelf, and I've seen the rules, like, holistically. But we can talk about, with optimism, we can talk about um, some of what we have seen drip-fed to us. Jared, I know that you've said you've been across most of what's going on. Yep. Do you want to kick us off? Like, where are we at? Like, what, what, what's some of the more significant changes and rules leaks that we've seen over the last, you know, five, six days that uh, Games Workshop has sort of been feeding to us bit by bit. So, to, uh, Sean, to start off with, the movement for different models will be uh, subject to their stat line. Okay, yep. So you're going to have things like certain infantry may not all be a standard six inches. And Terminators leaks, will move slower. Last last week, we, we knew there were going to be different values, but we didn't have any like leaks about what they might be. Do we know how much a basic marine moves? Do we know how much a elf moves? Uh, sorry, an Eldar model moves? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, we, know, more... we know a little bit. So what we do know is that a Space Marine will still be moving six inches. Okay. Uh, we know that, you know, a Dreadnought, for example, will move six inches. Terminators only move five. Okay. Okay, so heavy, heavier armor, slower moving. See, that's not a big change, though. That's, like, I mean, okay, they're, they're obviously granular. It's good because they're in- introducing granularity mm-hmm. um, to the different movement values, but that's not super significant. But I guess it's relevant. Oh, like, it's indicative of, of something like... We've all been in that position where we failed that, that six-inch charge. Now it's going to be a seven-inch charge. And now it'll be a seven-inch charge for Terminators. Like, we've all been in that scenario. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll, we'll change like, the game. Like, 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 let's be honest. That That is a big nerf. Like, sure, let's not, absolutely. We don't have to spend, you know, half an hour analysing it. But to lose a movement value on a model... One, one inch per turn... Mate, yeah, if you told me I had to take an inch off, I'd be pretty devastated. Well, it's like half of you. That's like a 50% <laughs> cut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but for example, Gilliman has a movement distance of eight inches. Oh, that's more. Okay, so when he first <laughs> when he first came out, there are a lot of questions about how do I use this guy? He's so slow. He only moves six inches. He can't join units. It, it gives us a bit of an idea about how some of these things may change. That is very characters. good for him. Like that, that, and like obviously, you know, we will go into more detail when all this stuff gets released in earnest. But that's a a big nerf for Terminators. Big buff for Gilliman. That's. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, anything else? Any other movement phase um, things that we that are new? Absolutely. So running has been rolled into the movement phase. So no longer will that be done in the shooting phase. It's called an advanced move. So you roll a dice and you uh, add the result to your movement uh, at the expense of shooting. So it works in the same way, but it is a, a dice roll. What's interesting is that it applies to all models, including vehicles and bikes. So no longer turbo boosting, you're going to have an advance, which is up to a roll. Oh, wow. So huge nerf for bikes. Potentially. Maybe. but It could be be 2d6. Yeah, exactly. Jet bikes might get a 2d6 move. But you're right. That is still a lot worse than 36 inches. It's a lot worse than 36. Uh, When I'm swinging around 36 inches, I feel pretty good. Um, (laughs) So, uh, yeah, okay, that's interesting. So they're they're streamlining (laughs) it, and um, it might result in nerfs for some of the more maneuverable units. Yes. Um, okay, so what else do we get? What else do we have for movement? Uh, the last thing that they've mentioned in movement is a optional fallback from combat. So you can choose to fall back from a combat in your turn. Uh, the deficit there being that you will not be able to shoot or charge in that turn. Uh, and that unit that you were in combat with will have an opportunity to shoot you. So it, it's almost like a hit and run. Uh, but with a few deficits. So that's going to open up a new avenue, I think, of strategic play. So just to clarify, you're going to elect at the start of your... Is it the start of your turn or the end of your opponent's turn? It's not particularly relevant, is it? No. So you elect to... It's um, at the start of your turn. At the start of your turn, question, you perform a fallback move. Correct. 
they will rather than in the past it's been like a consolidate they'll inst- rather than consolidating they'll get to shoot you they'll get a shooting phase it seems it seems like that will be the wording says enemies will be able to shoot at you now whether or not that's just saying you can be shot because you're out of combat i suspect it means they will get to make a return fire being that you're you're falling back at the start of your turn so for them to say enemies can shoot you i imagine means they'll get an opportunity to do so then but it's not really clear Okay, so the the a, inference there is interesting. Like you can't really take too much from that. It's hard to know. But it's it's your it's now your turn. Why would your opponent get to shoot you in your okay, turn? Okay, but the point is that just the fact that you can fall back out of combat. Yes, that's a that's big deal. Huge. That's that is a big a, change. Let's talk about that because that's a something that we've obviously heard about in the leaks, but maybe we haven't interrogated it too much. It effectively gives every unit hit and run. Um, or another way to look at it would be it's like our weapons are useless but you can't be run down it's it's like you get to fall back but you can't oh, get but swept more importantly it happens at the start of your turn exactly which yeah. means you can then shoot the unit that you're in combat with of course you this can also charge massive... that unit with another unit so if you get charged by a dreadnought uh, you know you get charged by an ironclad you don't have the ability to go through armor 13 you can fall back with that unit and counter charge them with another unit if you wish well of course remember, this, Jared, is in this edition everything can hurt it, it's everything but your point remains, if you're ineffective against the Dreadnought, you fall back, you yep. smash it with something else. That's that is a, That's a phenomenal boon that is to a, shooting armies. Like it really is. It and is. that MSU style of like, you know, just running lots of little units that can shoot everything, that's a phenomenal boon to them. It's a really big like kick in the kick in the teeth for um, close combat units that historically have used a lot of shenanigans, things like the smash attack, for example, to try and stay in combat so that they can't be shot off the board. Or, or yeah. It's a very interesting change. Mm-hmm. With this, um, you know, there's this overarching theme of close combat being more viable. That's a really interesting change that's happening there in conjunction with this, oh, but wait, close combat's going to be better. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That, that directly seems like a nerf to combat. So you must wonder if, if combat holistically is stronger, what buffs will that get to counteract something like this? Yeah, that's okay. very true. Well, let's move on. I mean, obviously, yeah, we've, we've spent a bit of time on that, but... The, the inference remains that it's simply effectively giving everything hit and run, um, as we've said, and that that as we said directly makes shooting. If you've got a shooting army, a guard gun line, and all your guardsmen have hit and run, then that's insane. Um, so yeah, that's good. It really opens, good up, it opens up a lot of new avenues of play. All right. So any other any other leaks? Any other phases that have yeah been- psychic phase they've they've talked a little bit about. Uh, now, it's a little bit vague exactly how that's going to change, but what Games Workshop has said directly is that previously each of your psychers would generate warp charge. Uh, in the new system, the phase has been reworked from the ground up. Now, each time you pick a psyker, you can cast as many spells as their data sheets state. Yep. So, similar to a mastery level. Uh, but it is a simpler casting mechanic, and, the, and this harkens a lot back to the Age of Sigmar method, where... You have a casting value, uh, and you need to roll dice to, I believe, match or beat that, I think is how it works. Do you have an amount of dice, or is it just, does it specify how many dice you roll? No, so the, each psyker can cast at the amount of powers that it knows, Yep. and to cast them, you have to successfully roll this uh, this, this particular and uh, this charge Okay, roll. so just to summarise things a little bit there... Um, Every spell now will have a casting value, and whenever you're attempting to manifest that power, you use a 2d6 roll, and then you then compare that to the casting value. So if it's, uh, the most common one, as we, as you're probably about to say, Jared, the, the, every psyker now knows the, the smite power. Okay, well, let's listen to what the smite power is sure. before we... So tell me smite. So smite has a warp charge value of 5. Yeah. If manifested, the closest visible enemy unit within 18 inches suffers d3 mortal wounds. If the result of the psychic test was more than 10, the target suffers D6 mortal wounds instead. Okay, so just to clarify... So then you get yep. 2D6. Two, so you go, okay, my unit's casting smite. You get 2D6, you roll it. If you roll a 7... Sorry, it was 5. But if you roll a 7, it is yep. successful because the okay. casting value was 5. Okay. So a 7 is a, is a successful test. You then get D3 mortal wounds. If you roll 11, you get D6 mortal wounds. Sure. Um, so in your opponent, they also roll 2D6... Is that how it works? And if they roll more than you, they will dispel the roll before it gets cast. Uh, the enemy psyker does have a chance to block the powers only if they're within 24 inches. Okay. So, all right. Um, 
But again, it depends on the mastery of the Psyker to dictate how many they can block. So I think the, the idea or the concept here, gameplay-wise, is previously you would have 15 Psykers to accumulate all this warp charge. You saw it a lot with, with Horrors, Horror Spam. You have 15 warp charge. You might only have a cast with two models. So the idea is to scrap that, and each model can cast the powers it knows. It can't hoard it's all the psychic charge, models, yeah. but you only get one roll to attempt to do that. So you can't put 10 warp charge into a single power because you must get it off. If you have one fundamental power you need off, you better beat that, that warp charge value with okay. your roll. I, I feel like I'm, I'm understanding it, and it's, it's obviously the psychic phase, and similar to the magic phase in, in Warhammer Fantasy before, have, with all of these phases have gone through many incantations over the years. There's been different versions of the magic phase in, in Warhammer and the psychic phase in 40k, but well, in, in many term, in many uh, editions of 40k, it wasn't a phase. It was just a, a part of the shooting. You, you do it at the your movement or you're shooting, whatever it might be. But um, I feel like I personally really like the psychic phase. I used to really like, and still do, obviously, the complexity of it. I feel like the complexity of it's going down a ton. The fact that with that power, for example, it auto-targets... Um, once again, I mean, obviously all this, the spells are going to be different, but it just seems like they're just removing the decision-making process of a lot of these, um, the, you know, in some games, they call these things micro decisions yep. because there is, there, of course there is a decision. The decision is, am I going to cast smite or am I going to cast iron arm, for example? Yep. Like it's, that's a decision and you just, you choose this, you know, to cast smite. But as far as smite goes, your only decisions are, okay, I've got my model. Where am I going to movement in the movement? Fa- where am I going to put in the movement phase to perhaps put it closer to a certain enemy unit? So yeah. you have a, a, a decision there, and then you have a decision, do I cast Smite or do I cast Iron Arm or do I cast something else that you might have? That's like only a couple of available decisions. Whereas in the current Psychic phase, there are... I'm going to say hundreds. How of, many dice do I allocate? Of, yeah, of all these, like... What order do I they're not cast even, them in? They're not even binary decisions. There's hundreds of decisions that are going on, like how many dice do I buff? Does my opponent have? Yeah, and they're right. removing all that into play. And I feel like, sure, it's going to make it more simple to understand, but it's going to remove a lot of the pleasure out of the game, I think. It will. I think I think the idea is just to cut down on the amount of time spent on, on those phases. Um and of course, in doing so, you're always going to remove some complexity, yeah, but which which removes some of the enjoyment of making them. That's decisions. like saying, you know, um, a, a feature film. When you go to the cinema, watch a feature film. It's two <laughs> I was and a half hours. Analogy. Yeah, like <laughs> let's let's make it so that no one you don't have to spend two and a half hours at a feature film. Let's just make all films ten minutes long, yeah. So that you don't have to when you go to see a film, you don't have to waste two and a half hours. You just waste ten minutes. The fact that they're like that to me, that attitude of like let's. Cutting. If you're using the term cutting, it's implying that it's bad and that it, it, it's it's toxic. And I agree there were many, and there are many toxic elements in 40k. But it, from and maybe it's too early to speak about it. But it seems like they're cutting. They cut everything. Yeah. How how about we we put it like this? So you go to the movies with with whichever one of your misses as you're seeing for the week, Jeremy. Uh, you've got two and a half hours to spare, and you decide to go see Lord of the Rings. Right, you fit that into two and a half hours. You get there, and what you realise is they've decided to play the, the extended edition that day, and um, you're there for three hours. But you have commitments at two and a half hours, so you miss some of that movie. That's kind of what tournament games are like at the moment, in that you have five five turns to play, but there is an overall restriction that says you cut off at two hours. If most games were being played within two hours, that would be okay, but... As, as you guys have discussed on your podcast previously, it, it's not that, happening. That is legitimately true. And, and that's a, a great, uh, I guess, a great counter um, point. It's a very fresh perspective, and I welcome it. And we and it's true. And, like, we are legitimately seeing games end on turn three and four. We've, we've, we've complained about that many times. I guess what I'm saying is I feel like... And maybe the, the game testers realise that in order to get a, a five, six turn, seven turn game within that two hours, they needed to do all these cuts... So maybe they were all part of a necessary, um, yeah. You know what would you it's, call it's it? It's the studio Evil. version, not the director's cut. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, okay. That sounds interesting. It's the radio edit. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I agree that the removal of that is not necessarily a good thing. I just I can see why they're doing those. Things. I just think like it doesn't. It didn't need to say the closest enemy unit. It could have just said pick an enemy unit within twenty four. Like why did why they well, have to make it? 
dumb it down. Like, it's almost like they're just deliberately making it more and more non micro decision and not I think engaging not engaging and sure there'll be some powers that are more engaging but they just I don't know it just feels I'm like I'm sure there'll be a lot of powers that are target a unit um, you got to remember this is this is a basic power that everybody every psycho knows so I think the more specific powers will be more complex alright just, just before we move on I, I, there's something I wanted to talk about as well mortal wounds okay yeah it's a big that, one that, that power references mortal wounds which means they exist in this game Sean and Jared, you both know more about Sigma than me, so why don't we talk a little bit about Mortal Wounds and what that might be? Well, they've, they've also discussed it in this leak, so okay. the phrasing here is, uh, Mortal Wounds are a new mechanic. These cannot be saved by any means and punch straight through thick armour and even invulnerable saves. All right, guys, what do you think about that as a mechanic to have in 40k? It's not toxic. It's I, not, it's I think not... it's interesting that they remove D on one hand and they replace it with a mechanic that functions similar in some ways. Um... I think that in the current iteration of 40k, 7th edition, if you look at something and say, okay, there is this removal power, there's a power of removal here, that is a very healthy thing to have in the game because it stops people throwing all their eggs into this basket of like, oh, I've got an AV-13 Dreadnought, and if they don't have, like, you know, strength X, they can't hurt me. By having mortal wounds, it means that no matter what your re-rollable invol with 2-up FMP save is, you can still be removed. That's, and I think that's good. I agree. And it's a mechanic that we, we discussed in the past for 40k that came in in a really minor ways. And the mechanic in many uh, the ways it's been described in the rules is the phasing mechanic. And the phasing mechanic is a mechanic that in, ignores invulnerable saves. And um, for Some example, assassins. Some assassins have that. Right. I believe the, um, the uh, what's it called? Um, Calidus. Calidus has that. Um, and there is, uh, you know, there's just very fringe. Oh, the first one we saw from, from my memory was the, um, the Necron's Tesseract, uh, was it, sorry, the Obelisk, sorry, the Obelisk. No, no, the, yeah, the Monolith. No, sorry, the Monolith, Well, that you. didn't have a phasing mechanic, but it, it, it just it, was removal. It in, induced a, a check that was a D6 result to remove the model. It was a toughness test, yeah. Yeah, D6 was um, like Black Mace is another, that model. another example. Yeah, so yeah. There, are, there are, look, they exist, and, and there are various elements that exist that's hard removal, um, to use a, a stomp card is the game. most prevalent. Stomp I think, is in, another in one. Game. But the thing is, and this is, uh, I really like that mechanic because, as Sean said, it's, it's, it removes to- toxicity. Like it removes these super hard to kill units from just um, oppressing the game with these ridiculous saves and these ridiculous wound counts. Yep. But the problem that I really dislike about th- not this power, this power heralds heralds what it, it, it's going to go towards. Correct is the D six mortal wound effect of. I'm going to do either one or six wounds or in between Yeah. with, uh, you know, whether... It, and, like, a good example in, in Sigma, and I do know enough about Sigma to know that the cannons have, do D6 mortal wounds. And that, to me, is ridiculous because you've got a weapon that can either do a damage of one, mm-hmm. two, three, four, five, or six. And when you roll a dice, sometimes you're going to roll a one and then other times you're going to roll a six that's a 600% difference yeah. on a single roll that could straight up win or lose the game then and there on, you know, and, and to me, but, I just but think... can I interject yeah. and say, Welcome you are roll. currently, you're currently happy to take barrage weapons. What yeah. are the chances of rolling a hit to rolling a 12 inch scatter? Yeah, but barrage, if you want to talk about barrage, like when you're using a barrage mechanic to snipe something out and like, it's a similar, I guess it's a similar kind of maybe concept of what you're trying to do. Barrage, there's lots of ways to improve your chances. You can cast you can cast prescience on your unit. You can take sure. a better barrage weapon. You can take reroll wounds. You can you can enfeeble the target. There's all these things you can do yeah. to create a favorable outcome for yourself and increase your odds. With this, it's just straight up roll a dice. Well, let, let's and put it. just pray pray to you know Jeebus that you're going to get the result you want. So so question, realistically to cast this, you need to roll. Well, if if you're talking about the D6. You need to roll a, a 10 or higher on two dice. Okay, so there's already a, a particular percentage chance of doing that. Yeah, but I'm not talking about that. I, like, I, I know what you're saying, but I'm saying, like, maybe not just smite as a power, but there will be, there will, seems as though there will be many. I'm sure that Dwayne Wood would love to, to chirp in here at this point and, and talk about Vortex of Doom. But that was a rule that introduced a, a, a D barrage effect, mm-hmm. right? That, you know, and to use a very, like, very niche example, if you throw that at a skimming flyer, right? You go, I'm going to D your flyer. You have uh, a one to six result where one is polarizingly bad, six is polarizingly good, 
and the results in between are also very mediocre. No, but the results... So there's less, like, there's le- there's actually less of an incremental sort of variance there. No, but the... the yeah, but exactly. But the point is that the, the, the vortex rule, the D rule, at least the average result is um, more likely to occur. Sure. Like, the, 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 the mean result is within a lower standard deviation. So what I'm saying is the standard deviation of the mean with D is lower than the standard deviations in a D6 roll. Okay. So and it's, not to get too technical, right? Okay, I agree. Not to get too technical, though, if you roll a... F- like, if you, let's say you look at the only the high end of the scale. You've got a D, a vortex of doom, it's hit a target. We're going to look at the high end of the scale. Four and five, they're, like, they're pretty mediocre, right? They can be absorbed. They can be, like, they can be... They're ginged, no better than, the, than, right? a, than rolling a two. That I know right? what you're saying, yeah. But when you go to that six, like, when you tip over from the five to the six, it's suddenly like, oh, oh, you're removed. True. That is a... There is a big swing between two, three, four, five... And then to six. I agree. With a mortal wound in this iteration, for example, a four is still four mortal wounds. Five is five mortal wounds. But Jeff, remember... Six is six mortal wounds. I, They're only incrementally better than the previous correct, result. But ITC did um, nerf that, that toxic D element, which was the six. The six on the shooting D was always a ridiculous mechanic. They nerfed it to be less, um, you know, just game winning. Sure. But... I just think that, yeah, and you're right, it's not just one or six. It's not, you don't roll a one or a six, you're rolling between one and six. Well, we like, can say it's an average of 3.5. Yeah, but it's one. just so, like, I feel, and I haven't played Sigma, I haven't played with cannons, but I, I just think that mortal wounds are a good mechanic to have, but D6 mortal wounds is a mechanic that if Too I variable. shoot you, for example, let's just look at an example, you have an Imperial Knight. An Imperial Knight might have 15 hull points. If I shoot you with two mechanics that do D6 wounds yeah. and do roll a six and a five, I pretty much am going to kill that knight turn one. I'm going to supplement it with extra shooting to kill that knight turn one. If I shoot you with the same two D6 of mortal wounds and just roll uh, two and a three, now I've done, instead of 11, I've done five whole points. I so guess that's, now the, the, that's whole the inherent game risk of taking that model, though, and you, and you take those models with the awareness of... It comes down to a dice Yeah, roll. I, I know. I, 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 I think that variance is something that we've spoken about previously, right? Variance is something that needs to be incorporated in the game because it helps promote the narrative and it helps promote this feeling of suspense and random variation and then, like, reacting to that. Like, you could say that D6 Mortal Wounds is, like, is like a heinous result, but if someone's got, like, a unit of five Terminators and I hit them with a, with a Vindicator, for example, I'm feeling pretty good because I'm going to kill most of that unit anyway. Do you know what I mean? Like the result there is kind of like linear. It's yeah, very much very similar. I know what you I know what you're saying. And I'm, when you look at variants, you know, we play a lot of games where there can be these big swings at certain points in the game. And they do occur, and that's just oh, and it, hap- it happens. It, it legitimately happens already. Like people shoot your Imperial Knight with a melter gun, blow it exactly. up, exactly, roll a six, but it just feels like there's more there's more um, multiplies you need to go through to achieve that result at the moment. Whereas in this current incantation, it's a single roll. And it's more likely to just achieve a polarizing result. So I haven't done the maths on it, but I think my original concept of the standard deviations being larger now uh, would be the case. And that is a problem when you have higher variance. But it is what it is. Look, not, I, I think it'll be interesting to game. see how mortal wounds works and, and how often and common they are in armies. Realistically, we've only seen one example yet. We still don't know. Could as a, you know, you said for an example, a vindicator give mortal wounds, or could it just be next three rend? Uh, you know, we're seeing this rend and, and this armor penetration come out. So, at what point are you negative three to a save, or are you a mortal wound? Look, we we really don't know how well, that's going to line up. So that, it's a good actually. conversation to have. Why don't we talk about the rend? Because we haven't actually mentioned that yet. So that's okay. the, that's well, the well, different side just, of the just, coin. Yeah, you're right. But let's hold that discussion there. Let's keep going through the changes. Jared's got them in front of him. Um, we can just keep rolling through these changes. We'll come yep. back to the Ren mechanic. So, Psychic phase. Next, we'll come to the shooting phase, which is where we're at at the moment. So, this will be the last one. Uh, I guess the biggest change, first of all, is ballistic skill. Everybody will now have a, a set to hit roll, which was pretty much how it already worked. Yep. There wasn't really much of a ballistic skill um, playing with no. another mechanic. Yep. Uh, the big one here is regarding what... Uh, used to be snap firing in regards to heavy weapons. So snap firing doesn't seem to be a thing. If you are holding a heavy weapon and you've moved, it'll be a, a flat negative one to your two hit roll. Well, that, that's huge. That because that 
um, basically means that there's no such thing as all you know. Snap firing is a, a lot less inhibiting than it is now. A space marine with a las cannon will hit on fours if he moved. That's good. That, that's the effective result. Yeah, so, sure. What does that mean? I'll take plasma cannons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I I think that obviously we need to see the stats on these new weapon type, like the new weapon stats. But that definitely makes heavy weapons across the board for everybody way better. Way better. Uh, I way, think way better. You will see a resurgence of the old ten man tactical squad with a missile launcher um, come back. Definitely. Yeah, because it's so. Yeah, we're, like as you said, Jared, the tactical humble tactical squad. It just means that. In the past, where you would, you know, you would, for example, tactical squad. If you want to take a, a, a tactical squad out of a drop pod, you would never put it, give them a heavy weapon because they're coming down, they're shooting. You're going to always be wanting to moving, moving towards objectives, moving towards assaults. Um, whereas now you can comfortably give them a heavy bolter, knowing that that heavy bolter Hell is yeah. going to bolster their shooting. You know, a missile launch is going to bolster their flex- flexibility. I think that you're going to find all those unloved heavy weapons. Those, you know, standard plasma cannons, missile launches, heavy bolters are all going to start to see play. I think the game, between everything being able to wound everything, whatever that ends up meaning, things like heavy weapons always being of some use, it's going to be a game of more engagement. I feel like two players are going to be able to use their models. You're not going to get a situation where a particular element of the gameplay is removed from them. Yeah, that, that's a good way of looking at it. I agree. When you, in the past, it's like, oh, you have AV-13. I don't have any Strength 7 in this part of the battlefield. I guess I just lose this like I lose now. Like That's it, right. It, it's demoralizing to people. Yeah, um, it, it prevents them from, from actually playing a game with their opponent. And I think uh, that that's going to become more of a common thing with stuff like this. Okay. Sean, what do you uh, think? I don't know. I think that, you know, and I've heard these arguments in the past about how people say, oh, like, he's got a land raider. Like, what do I do? And it's like, if you ever written your list, thinking that at some point, somewhere, somebody could have an AV-14 vehicle, then you deserve to be punished. Because that is, um, that is, neg- that is gross negligence. <laughs> it's like putting on putting drag slicks on your car, and then going for a cruise in this weather, and then, oh, like, the car in front of me stopped, so I had an accident. And it's like, well, maybe don't wear, use drag slicks in, this, in the rain. Like, it's ridiculous. So, I think that... Yeah. A lot of this is actually... It does simplify the game. It does... You're right. It does reward newer players who are coming in because they can't make the wrong choices. The wrong choices, pre, like, historically would have been very polarizing. If you did not have, like, a melter gun in your army, you weren't going to kill a vehicle, period, right? Now, it doesn't really matter what your bad choices are. You're not going to be punished as hard. Mm. So... I'll open a counter-argument to that. Counter-argument is... Two players play a game. One player has a squad of melter guns. They're against the land raider. They shoot it at the land raider. That's all they can do. Um, or, or, actually, sorry, let's scrap that. Let's say the inverse. They've got a, an army with a whole lot of bolters. They come against a battle company. They can't get through the rhinos. They have to shoot the marines. It makes a decision for them. Having the fact that a bolter can go through a land raider, but it might have a very small chance to do it, Gives them more options, and they might choose the least efficient option. That's true. So, it, in it, opening another element of interaction, people will still make mistakes. Is what you're saying? Exactly. People will make mistakes, and they'll have an op- a more of an opportunity to make a mistake because they may identify that this small chance of achieving this is and worth the risk, and mistake. it may pay off for them. But it also may be the thing that loses them the game. Whereas before, they wouldn't have even targeted that as an option because it couldn't interact. That's that's very true, and I think that that kind of touches on what I was going to kind of say, is that despite this optimism we have now, which is the optimism of, oh, because I, I really want to see, and I'm, I'm looking forward, you know, we're still going to look at the Ren stats and all that kind of stuff, but I'm really looking forward to seeing what the stats might be on a heavy bolter, seeing what the new stats might be on a Psy Cannon, on a Silencer, and all these weapons that I've got yeah, models plasma with. Plasma Cannon. Yeah, exactly, but at the end of the day, it's not going to take pl- competitive players too long to work out what the best weapons are. And Correct. those are the weapons people will take. So even though, sure, there's going to be that, like, um, what would you call it, a, um, compression of uh, the, 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 the gulf, like the gulf between the different weapon types is going to be compressed so that, sure, uh, the best weapon might still be a grav cannon, but it's not going to be as good comparatively as it used to be. However, um, 
people will still take the best weapons. I guess is what I'm trying to say. So it's all it's all very interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm excited for it. Oh, it's interesting. I'll, I'll be honest, and I'll say it straight up. I'm not excited for it. you Because, not. no, I'm not. And I'll tell you why I'm not. Games Workshop, for all their faults, are an incredibly smart company. They've got a really, a lot of, like, their, their team of Games Workshop developers, there is a lot of really intelligent people in that little council, right? And they are smart enough to know that the, currently, in the current Space Marine meta, right, the best weapon is a grav cannon. Guess what every competitive player across the nation, across the globe has? No grav cannons. Hmm. They're here to make money, and they need to make money in order to survive. And I respect that because that life is about that. You cannot live comfortably without money. You need to make money. You're a company. You're a public company. You need to make money. How are we going to make money? Let's make sure grav is not the best weapon. I, I agree with that's probably the case. So um. everyone who was laughed over having a heavy bolter previously. Which is literally like one person. <laughs> in, in every like 20 game clubs, there's one guy with back. a heavy bolted dev squad. But you know what? They've been ridiculed for so long. They've probably burnt their models already. They're probably like... like and legit. they're now going to rebuy them. They've probably like broken all the heavy bolters <laughs> off to, to put on grab they're cannons. Just, they're just glued melter bombs on them. They've just glued melter bombs on. Correct. Blue tack scattered by. And now <laughs> games are like, guys, you know what? The mighty heavy bolter, it's back. Let's try it. The heavy bolter is back, I, and it's big, and it's beastly, and you need heavy bolters. I get to pull all the scatter bikes off my bikes and use them, <laughs> use them as shuriken guns again. So okay, Shuriken catapults. That's, that's what's going to happen. So, it's great that things are being shaken up. Like, sorry, forgive my pessimism. It is great that things are being shaken up. I, holistically, I really want this to come in. As we said last episode, Jeremy, I got to play with the Bark Star again on the weekend. It's uh, it makes me want to vomit on the table. Like the, it makes me want to make well, those your, models look your, better painted. With your performance right? with it, I don't blame you. <laughs> so I'm really glad things are changing. However, I know the implications of that are I'm going to have to go back and remodel all my competitive well, army. Let's the, oh, look. I've got a bits box with probably ten heavy bolters in oh, it. Oh man! If, if you were a space oh, marine player. No, oh, dude. <laughs> ten bucks, ten bucks. So, and you know what's funny? Um, grav cannons go for like ten bucks these days because people buy the um, people that want to buy a grav cannon. Yep. Nobody's going to sell the bits for a grav cannon out of their um, dev kit for less than probably ten bucks a, a gun. No. Whereas these days, you're probably heavy bolters. Want to sell heavy bolters? Ten bucks. If, I'm gonna if make you are a space marine player and you do not have ten missile launchers in your bits box, you are not a space marine player. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, or you were a really cunning, like, you know, on the stock market, and you just offloaded all your heavy missile launches to the... I don't even know. You just offloaded them on eBay. Oh, man, I'm sure if you're, you're good at the stock market, you know these things come and these things go, and heavy Correct. bolters are, are back. I've sold them my, I've sold them <laughs> my heavy bolter sold stock. Them I, I've sold them low. Now I'm going to buy back before they, like, skyrocket. Yeah. <laughs> um, Winning strategy. <laughs> heading, heading back to the changes, though, one more thing I want to I wanna mention is uh, shooting and how that interacts interacts sorry with uh, with cover saves. Uh, so things like cover saves uh, are, 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 I believe, an addition to your save. Uh, but one thing it mentions here is that smoke launches from vehicles, which previously have given a cover save, will now also be a neg one to hit. Yeah, which is interesting. That's really good. That's a they're bringing in a lot of the old, and obviously this might might be the case in in AOS, but a lot of the old Warhammer Fantasy rules in Warhammer Fantasy. When you used to shoot at things at long range, you used to have a negative to hit modifier. When you used to shoot at things in forest or in cover, you'd have a negative to hit modifier. So it's almost like they're bringing a lot of the old mechanics back into the game, and I actually really like those particular mechanics. They're very granular, and they're also very simple. Yeah. Um, they don't. They they avoid all these kind of constant dice rolls we have. And one of the worst things with cover is that: Am I twenty five percent obscured? Do I get this? Do I get that? It's a lot easier if they just say, "Okay, you're in the thing." Negative, negative one to one hit. hit. So we don't. Right. We don't so, have to argue about whether it's a four up or a five. You have up, a say. space marine. He's got a las cannon. He's moved that turn. He's shooting at a vehicle with with a thing. He's now negative two to hit. Normally hits on threes. He's now hitting on fives. Still better than snap firing. Yeah. Um, so, look, in- interesting changes, but one thing that they've mentioned regarding that cover save, so a cover save, apart from smoke launches that we mentioned, uh, will be an addition or a, or a buff or a bonus to your armor save. Um, one thing it mentions, though, is obviously with weapons having this, you know, sh- uh, rend mechanic, they may go through the cover. So, rend will work on the, your modified save. So, right. let's, let's talk about rend now. 
So let's just say, let's just like create a situation here. So rend, rend is a mechanic where it's it's instead of like historically we've had like an AP value for weapons, right? Yes. Rend is a new mechanic which represents an AP of a weapon, but instead of uh, ignoring armor at a certain value, it has a static. It's a static value that will always apply that negative modifier to your opponent's save. So let's say we've got a, a tactical marine and he's sitting in in a cu- in cover. Yep. So he's got a three up. Normally he's got a three up armor save. Yep. And we're assuming, based on the current leaks we have, that it would modify perhaps to a two-up save. So this marine is yep. in cover. He now has a two-up save Plus to reflect one. that he's in cover. Now, let's say he gets hit with one of the weapons that has a red. Now, cannon. we know a LAS cannon. What are the new stats on a LAS cannon? Okay. So, say, for example, uh, and I, I don't know if we've got the actual stats for the LAS cannon here. Let me see. I can tell you what I believe they're red three. Yeah. So, you've got a space marine normally with a three-up. Plus one from cover gives him a two-up. Yep. A neg three will take him down to a five-up. So you, you'll, you'll still roll to wound with a strength value, right? Last cannon still has a strength value? Yes. So you still will, you'll hit, you roll to hit with a three up, you'll roll to wound, you wound the space marine, he, you work out the rend value, negative three on the modified two up save, pushes you back to five up, yep. the marine takes his five up save. So it's it's almost like he would, he would get the same save as he would now in cover, because sure. currently he would still get a five up. Works out to be the same yeah. in a very obtuse way. But obviously it allows for, as we've said, more granularity and he would. different... Yeah. But I'm the just, difference is if you have a, an orc boy uh, who normally has a, a save... Six up six save. Up, six up. Save. He is in cover. He gets plus one. He's a five up. <coughs> a Laz Cannon will remove that save. It'll just go through. So it doesn't... Yeah. So potentially Laz Cannons, not only do they have what used to be an AP value, they may effectively have Ignore's cover. That's interesting. That's a good way of looking at it. So Ren now... The whole cover mechanic is no longer an invulnerable save. It used to be this kind of pseudo invulnerable save, but now it's not. Now it's this kind now of now it is not. It is a, it is a buff save. that can also be negated. Yeah, it's I'm, awesome. I'm just looking forward to one up terminators walking through forests. Yeah, that's the thing, right? All right look, <laughs> I, I don't know. Well, you won't. I don't know. Will, 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 will they have? Will they have, <laughs> will will they have the a rule where a one is always a fail, like they do? Who oh, knows? No. They, they won't need that rule. Maybe if there's enough rend in the game to change that one up oh, to a three up or a four up. Always, I think ones like historically ones um, always been a fail. Um, even in the old school days of your uh, one plus armor save Reeks Guard Knights. In, we, uh, we might have to reach know. out to Josh Sven to I, tell us how Sigma yeah, works. Feel so, free. Tell me this, Joe Jarrett, just as a, so I understand a bit more about like the basic mechanics of like you know very common prevalent weapons and stuff like that. The the uh, stalwart bolter, which has been a staple of the Imperium for you know since before the time of the legions, basically. How much? Like, what can we expect from a bolter these days? What, just as a bit of Even a baseline comparison. Even the Sigmarines have bolters these days. Pretty much. Yeah. They've got the uh, there's the little crossbows, crossbows with yeah. bolter, bolter bows. So I think that I think it's maintaining that that strength four value on a marine, which will be on threes. But where does it fall in with that rend? Is it going to get a rend value? So a bolter does not have a rend value. Ah, oh, so, interesting. Yeah, so bolters went from obviously having AP five, which meant they they negated some saves. Now they won't went be doing through a guardsman. Any, they won't be going yep. through guardsmen anymore. That's very interesting, and I think that that um, might hearken what GW have been saying in line with uh, making the shooting phase less prevalent, making things more close combat orientated. Maybe we'll see an interesting paradigm where a lot of the small arms fire, which we traditionally saw from, like, you know, be it bikes or marines or, or gorse weapons, whatever it is, perhaps we'll now start to see this paradigm where heavy weapons actually become of a, a far more significant value, not only with the addition of, like, that negative one to hit roll which is a pseudo snap firing being negative one to hit, mm. we'll also see them actually punching through armor above and beyond what most other guns can do. Yeah, that's that's true. And I think it, it'll be interesting to see how they how they introduce that. Um, I do think it's a little bit weird that, that, that bolters have no red value um, because it, effectively they become... They don't get that... I guess, I guess las guns are strength three. Bolters have the extra yeah, strength. But... Right. You know, bolters are supposed to be good weapons. They, they, you know, fluff wise, they're pretty potent, but they're I, RPGs, pretty much, man. They they <laughs> shoot you with bolts that explode inside you. I know, so that's it's rough. It's bizarre that they just <laughs> don't rough. do anything. But I, I, you know, I guess it's all balanced. And I guess one thing Games Workshop have been saying is that they they kind of 
uh, uh, accumulated. They generated this team of, of lots of playtesters, lots of people from around the competitive circuit. Apparently, a lot of the um, English competitive players, yep. they got some of the Americans over. So there's this group of players that have helped them playtest this game, obviously based on that kind of AOS um, skeleton. Yeah, yeah. And so you, we hope that those players have, have, have helped GW iron out some of the kinks. Look, I'm, I'm sure they have, and I'm sure that... Look, Regardless of what the final result is, and, and we'll, we'll figure that out when it comes, but what we can say is that this will be the edition that has been play-tested the most widely through various communities. Mm. So whether the result of that is really, really good, or it's just a little bit good, or it ends up not being great, they've, they've done their due diligence, I feel, in, in making it the best that they can make it. And you could argue that AOS has been a two-year play-test for them as well. Because you could. You that's, can, you that's can make a, that and that might have been part of the master plan, but it's a game that, you know, uh, has been going around. They're changing it. Obviously, they're planning perhaps to... Maybe they're planning a new edition for AOS. Who knows? Maybe one day we'll see AOS and 40K align in the same way that War Machine and Hordes do. It's crazy So talk. that you could actually <laughs> play your Sigmarines... Age of Hammer. Age of <laughs> Hammer. Warhammer. We could just be called Warhammer. <laughs> Who would have thought it? Go to a Warhammer store and play Warhammer. All right, I got a couple more things to throw at you, right? So, while we're on the topic of fluff, in regards Can to I? that, yeah, okay. Mm. Who heard? Who heard about uh, Ulanor and uh, Armageddon? Armageddon. Jared? Armageddon. Do you want to shed some light on that for us? Armageddon and on. Well, uh, they've basically come out and said Armageddon is going to be a new playground again. Yep. Uh, so Armageddon, <laughs> quick, quick catch up. Armageddon First War was when Angron and his Bloodthirster mates came down. And uh, my, my good Sean's <laughs> my best mate Hyperion. Sean's great shot knights. that guy down. Yeah, he was pretty good. Came and shot him straight back. It was like a hot girl in the club that you approached, Jeremy. Just shut just got shut down. I shut it down. <laughs> <laughs> just got right. shut down. Absolutely. So go on, Armageddon Second War. Armageddon Second War. Gazgul and Orcs. Come, come to fuck for Armageddon. Uh, and then Third War was a rehash of that. So or- Orcs again, bigger, badder, stronger. And um, it looks like going to have another war. And, but- and what, it, what it says now is that that war is still ongoing. There's still Orcs and Imperial guys fucking around. Uh, but Korn has turned his eye back on the planet. So, but tell me, tell me this, Jared. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Why does Gazgol want Armageddon so damn bad? Uh, it's their spiritual homeworld, I believe. <laughs> A.K.A.? Um, A.K.A. Ulanor. Uh, for you fluff bunnies that, that may recognise that name, uh, during the Great Crusade, uh, Horus and the Emps off to reclaim worlds and, and lay, lay waste to Xenos, uh, faced a, a massive incursion of, of orcs on this planet. Yep, the spiritual and home of the orcs. <laughs> apparently so. Yeah. Uh, the Emperor found himself in a, in a chokehold, um, and Big Bad War Boss was about to take off his head. It's a pretty big War Boss, I, I read. Uh, it's huge. Pretty huge. It's pretty almost, huge. It was going to be like me. So was, I had the Emperor, so just to rehash... Yeah, just around around, around the same, same, same circumference. I tall, had, tall I had the Emperor in, same in, in, in a lock. So, so what happened? Big as an elephant, right? Big <laughs> tusks and everything. Yeah, no, like a moose. We talked about moose a couple of episodes ago. <laughs> um... Um, so glad you remembered. Yeah, but but and I don't I don't know if this is new fluff. I'm not sure, or if it was always in there and I missed it. But it, it was turns news out to me. Armageddon is is renamed Ulanor. Yeah, so they are the so same, it's the same planet. Yeah. No, so it's interesting. the Emperor I'm... almost died to an orc there, and now the orcs are they they want to go back. They well, just want to go home, man. It's a very interesting fluff. Like I, I remember re- in all the a lot of the horror heresy books, they talk about how they for the triumph at Ulanor, they like flattened the whole planet and they they made these roads that are like. 10 or 20 kilometre circumference roads to get all the tanks. Not circumference, sorry, width. Um, thinking about I, the do, I do burnouts, You're still thinking about yourself. I do burnouts. You're still thinking about yourself, hey, man. I, I do burnouts, It's not man. circumference. <laughs> I need circular roads because uh, I, I burn my tyres. You roll, you roll home. I roll home, but um, <laughs> interesting fluff. Interesting fluff. Yeah, sure, well, I mean... You know a lot about it. But little little did we know last year putting on the big uh, Armageddon and Pax <laughs> battle that we were, we were lining up for the uh, new fluff. Um, anyway, one last thing to talk about since we're talking about fluffing. Um, Sean, no, we're talking about the new Marines in one of the releases uh, today. Today. They talked about their, their Gilliman's obviously awake. He's, 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 um, you know, he's, he's, he's not here to fuck spiders. He's not here. 
uh, to muck around and he's breeding some new marines. Yeah. Um, and him apparently and they're, they're bigger and badder than, than the other marines. Yeah, What's he, going him on and, there? Him and Call. So Call, the uh, the master artificer that built his armour. Belly Call. Belly, belly. belly Call. He, uh, and him uh, have teamed up and they want to rebuild the Imperium in you. They're sick of chaos shitting on their doorstep and um, they want to fight back a little. So We've they, been hearing for... What, 20 years how the Imperium is on the absolute edge of extinction. You know, the Orcs are going to end them. The Tyranids are close to ending them. The Tau are, are, are bad and fucking not mucking yeah, around. Yeah, Tau are shooting stuff. <laughs> um, and, and the Imperium, I guess, wants to fight back. It's mm. it's interesting. It's a bit of like a, a narrative hook to keep things in stalemate. They've said they want to progress the story, and uh, they are making efforts to do that. But this is now like a new another hook that they, they're going to layer in there to say, you know what? Things have escalated, like it's progressed, but oh, here's another stalemate. Uh, I think it's just <laughs> so, a, there is way. only war. It's 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 In the, the catch call. Yep. Look, I, I found it interesting because when um, you know, for AOS came out, they released the the you know the Sigmarites. Um, yeah. And they were they were unhurt. They weren't part of the previous um, Warhammer Fantasy fluff. The aesthetic was totally new. It resembled in some ways some 40k motifs, some of the Gothic motifs in 40k, but. Um, what's interesting is when, when we were talking about it last week, we we're talking about that the, they they mentioned there were going to be new factions in the, yes. in the 40k, and Sean and I were kind of thinking we we're talking about the Mechagnid, Mech, Megarachnids and various options there might be. But what if a new faction is just these big Marines, Imperium 2.0, the Imperium 2.0 Marines that just happen to be the same scale as Sigmarines? Who knows? Maybe Sigmarines. I've got I've got to I've got to get on eBay buy a crap ton of heavy bolters and start snapping all the weapons off by Sigmarines. Hey, <laughs> just probably won't need slapping to, heavy bolters on there. You'll just buy some new kits and go from there. But uh, look, it wouldn't I surprise think, me. On a serious note, I think it's interesting, right, because you have Space Marines who are meant to be quite elite in, in what they are on their own. You then have Terminators, which are an elite version of Space Marines. Mm. You have Centurions, which are kind of Space Marines in an exoskeleton suit. You've got a lot of Space Marines, which are already elite, and then versions of Space Marines, which well, are super elite. Like the you have Grey Knights, Watch. which are even an, an elite version of a Terminator, which is an elite version of a Space Marine. So where exactly this will fit in the... We have a Space Marine, and then we have a better Space Marine, and then, and then variations of better Space Marines. I, I really don't know. I, I don't know if it's needed... I'm sure a lot of people will want to buy big marines, and so I'm sure they'll sell like hotcakes. Yeah, insert exhibit uh, oh, meme here. I think, I think, I think, Jeremy, you actually summed it up the best in the group chat. I think it was just today. We've, we've built more marines so you can be more elite while you're elite. Yeah, you be, can you can elite be elite while you're elite while you're elite, elite while you're elite. <laughs> well, the point is, it's it's kind of like <laughs> they already know that we all have marines. Every guy, every 40k player has marines, and and they they want to release this new set, and they kind of feel like well. We've made Marines good. People are going to play Marines again, of course, but let's. we need to sell new kits. We've just released a bunch of kits. Like, how are we going to get new kits to be sold? We need a, a new Marine kit. Yeah, I, it's I think gonna... it's twofold. It's definitely a sales, and it's also from the narrative point of view of what is Gilliman doing now? He's awake, right? He's, he's kind of become the head of the, the Imperium. What does he do? Well, he builds something that, that's cooler and better. Unless... And, this you is know, not, that's not true, though, because this is a plan 10,000 years in the making. So does that assert that, like... I don't know. Like, what, what, what does that is, mean? Is it, like though? Do you think like, they were always going to... <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure that, that they ever intended on the Primarchs coming back. I think that they've... They've come to a point where they're ready to release a new edition, and, and a lot of... You know what? This wouldn't have come about, I think, if they hadn't have opened their themselves to engaging with the community again. I, I think if that change hadn't have happened internally, we wouldn't have seen the, the type of releases we are now. And so, I don't think this this was a plan even you know ten years in the in the making. Oh, interesting, interesting. Yeah, look, I think uh, you probably, I think both of you are right in a way. I think there's some cynical ways to look at it. There's some optimistic ways of looking at it. I think probably this whole mar- new marine release. All bullcrap aside. I oh think, man! Despite what I've said, I'll, I'll be buying. Yeah, a box. and it's likely it's probably <laughs> going to be it's probably going to be like an honor guard. Are you going to paint it? Honor guard style release. Like you know, you've got um, <laughs> there's the minus Kelgar box when you, you get minus Kelgar and he comes with you know four or five of the really well sculpted honor guard. It's probably going to be a similar type of model, very kind of Roman esque, uh, very ornate, but a big big yep. ultramarines. And, and, and cool. New edition, new starter box. 
I'll come out and say it. You, you probably get five of the of the new marines in the starter box. They said ultramarines in the starter box. Ultramarines versus orcs. Oh, was it no Death Guard? Death sorry, Guard. Death, Death, Guard. Yeah, Death Guard is looking to be likely. Yeah, interesting. All right, well, we're going to wrap this up, Jared. But I, not to rehash. This episode's been like very sprawling in its discussion. It's happened very <laughs> naturally, which is which is okay. It's good to have that. But I do want to just touch back very briefly on the assault. Can you close this out with any any little uh, teasers? Any little uh, any little the people that have, have been um, bored enough to make it to the end of the <laughs> podcast? Do they get a reward? Uh, <laughs> let me see what I've got here for you. So I, I can give you. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of something. So over the uh, over the weekend in the event, there are five games. As we know, there's there's three typical deployments in the book. Uh, so we often see a repeat of a couple of those deployment methods. I will be bringing back something old school from Third Ed in regards to deployment methods, and there will be a table quarters game Ooh. where you alternate deployment unit by unit. Alternate deployment. That's very interesting. Okay. So, something we haven't seen in a while, but... Uh, what else can you give me to keep me on the edge of my seat? Oh, you want more? So, MSU. MSU heard it here first. <laughs> MSU. Um, Does that mean that independent characters can be deployed one at a time? Yeah. Attached to units? No, they would. Yeah. And not, not attached. If they're attached to the unit, they have to go down with the unit. Okay. Oh, I don't know. You have to read the rule book, Jared. <laughs> He's writing the rule book, he gives. <laughs> <laughs> the mission pack should, uh, should clear that up. Um, what else can I give you? I will give you that, um, the last mission is a relic style mission. Ooh! Relic. Now, Death stars. Death now, stars. Can I, can I look to, and Jeremy, you mentioned, might have mentioned this earlier on about capturing Cypher. Can I look to maybe score another sick model from JB Painting at this event? Can I look to take home a little, a little gimme prize? Uh, look, yet to be determined, but okay. currently no. Okay. Currently right. no. Well... See, Jared, um, thanks for coming on board this uh, this episode. It's been obviously good to talk through the hunt, uh, sorry, the assault, talk through <laughs> your thoughts on um, tribord format, your thoughts on the new changes. Um, and your thoughts on a painting slash, you know, narrative rubric. Like, that's also very interesting. Absolutely, guys. Thank you for having me. No, thank you. And we'll see you guys next week for uh, episode 17. At that point, we will have played the assault. So, um, or will we? Uh, you're about three weeks out. Oh, three weeks out. From the event. Stay we'll tuned it, for episode. Stay tuned for episode twenty. It'll be fine. Um, all right, cool. all right, guys. Uh, I'm I'm Sean, Jeremy, and Jared, and this has been uh, State of the Meta episode sixteen, and uh, we'll close out here. Catch you later.